Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And Matt Hoover has returned so we can talk about the controversies of eco socialism, um, of which there are many. Um, and I think very recently, uh, in July, August of, of this year, uh, Monthly Review put out um, its, its uh, degrowth response issue uh, where John Bellamy Foster apparently has finally picked sides, I guess, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, but we've also seen an increasing distance between John Bellamy Foster and Jason Moore, as I saw when I interviewed Jason and frankly got more than I was expecting on the uh, Foster Moore uh, Sato split. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit. You know, last time we talked about the relationship of unions to the ecological movement and how important they really were as far as like actually getting stuff done for for environmental change um, and the integration with that into labor. Um, but I wanted to go into, you know, the kind of three. I think now that it's been phrased as there's three phases of eco-socialism, but the current phase actually itself seems to be at least three different schools of thought. Mm -hmm. So if not more. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I roughly break it into you um, and, and some of the bright greeners. I don't think you're quite as, as optimistic as say Lee Phillips, but, mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, John Melly, John Bellamy Foster, Kohei Sato, D. Grove, and then the capitalist scene people. Uh, that's kind of my rough okay. uh, spectrum. Although, when I talk about D. Grove, too, even though it's like super hot right now and everyone can't shut up about it, <laughs> um, I, I don't know what it means because, the as we were talking a little bit before the show, there's at least three different things going on that get called degrowth. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to throw out books so that mm. people kind of know how I'm linking them. There's the Jackson Hinkle school and his, his books. Hinkle. Yeah. Jackson, not Jackson, Jason, Jason. Yeah, there's this sort of mechanism guy who I think yeah, is Jackson is, 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 uh, uh, yes, man. Those names are too close. Jason. Right. Hinkle, Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jason. And, eco-socialist uh get more distinct names from other other things that are still adjacent to marxism um <laughs> uh but he's sort of the mmtd growth school i guess um there's whatever sato and bellamy foster on and i'm not sure you can totally say they're copacetic but they're close yeah foster recently got mad at sato um, yeah so they're they're starting to, to split up a little right and then which is probably why I'm going to see less Sato in the monthly review. No. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's um, like the half earth socialism slash mm -hmm. uh, there's a few other people associated with it who are more explicit and not, I don't seem to give a shit as much of, as maybe the center group as being actually Marxist. So, Oh yeah. They attack Marxism in their book. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so to get back to the beginning, though, I think to understand how we got here, we got to go through the dreaded 70s, <laughs> um, uh, which comes up on my podcast a lot. Apparently, the 70s and when Marxism and actually most of everything seemed to have lost its mind. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so do you agree with the three generations of equal socialism framework anyway? Like... Uh, well, I got, uh, as far as I can tell, that that whole um, framework was was uh, invented by John Bellamy Foster, I think, mm -hmm. to kind of tell a story in which, you know, the the phases lead up to the metabolic rift school. So it's kind of like uh, it was all leading up to their their perspectives. To me, seems a bit, um, you know uh teleological <laughs> uh so but you know i i i do see kind of um 
you know, phases. I think in the seventies, um, there was, uh, you know, I think Foster does cover that, that there was this idea that like Marxism was inherently not environmental. And so it needed to be kind of greened and, um, and, and then they explicitly thought it was from the outside. Like it had, like, we have to fight Marxist Prometheism, but yes. we got to enforce it on Marx because it's not in Marx. Marx bad. Marx, right. Mar right. Marx dirty Ricardian. Like, right. <laughs> right, 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 right. And then Foster comes around to say, no, Marx good, right? If we dig deep enough into volume three and then into all these sort of you know, his dissertation, all his different writings, you can see this deeply materialist, deeply ecological thinker, which fair enough. Um, and, and then out of that, you get very many different schools like uh, James O'Connor, who's second contradiction of capitalism, which um, I think is trying to say, hey, hey, guys, we need a Marxism that can speak to new social movements. He really framed it in that sense, like there are these new social movements. And if we need a kind of different theory of capitalist crisis to, to, to take into account the ecological crisis. I mean, well, even, even the phraseology very much screams, I am responding to seventies Maoism because primary and secondary talk, contradiction talk is very much a 60s, seventies Maoist framework. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd, I'd love to know, you know, he wrote another famous book in the seventies called fiscal crisis of the state. Um, <laughs> And I, I really should dig deeper about what his sort of organizational roots are. Mm. Um, but to me, like when you read, um, he has a, a book of essays on ecological Marxism, and it's just, it's very clear. He kind of lays it out like, you know, the, the traditional Marxism was good for understanding like class struggle and production and party formation and unions. But to study the environmental crisis, we need a kind of new theory of crisis. We need a new theory of a contradiction and 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 then that theory can then be taken up by this kind of um by these new social movements that everyone thought were kind of you know the labor movement socialism it's kind of dead now we need the new social movements right mm -hmm. and and uh i don't think they you know they really knew yet that they were we were just in a long period of of, of defeat and just sort of capital was triumphant right um and so uh they were just like let's get on to the new thing right um so yeah so those, yeah. i mean there's many different directions you can go many there's different perspectives i guess the only perspective i would add that i re that i remember often getting brought up as a kind of distinct school is the paul burkett like response and then we get to I guess around 20 teens, this current wave of like this, the metabolic riff within the metabolic riff school, as I like to call it, <laughs> like the, the, like the emergence of like metabolic riff uh, into like capitalist scene thinking versus what like getting John Bellamy Foster versus uh, Kohei Saito's uh, or Saito's. Um, a particular form of degrowth. Um, uh, some of the arguments, and I, maybe I will get pushback from people who've been on the show before, but um, seem to me largely semantic. Um, are not mm -hmm. even semantic. They're like optimal. They're like optimal framework discussions. They don't really clearly necessary. Like whether or not we're talking about the capitalizing or the anthropocene does have like implications for the way we think but they don't it neither suggest a, a way of understanding socialism inherently nor uh a set of policies inherently so i, I yeah um so you've been kind of pulled these days uh from mr uh yes labor is important to the environmental moment mm -hmm. to mr hey uh um degrowth debate you are against it even though you're not totally anyway i've read enough of your stuff to know that you you a lot of your your disagreements on the framework has to do with the framework and then other implications so um so uh what is your thought Let, let's kind of get into this uh so we have that that new left piece that we're the new left 
things that we're talking about. By the time we get to the metabolic risk school, mm-hmm. um, how seriously do you take the metabolic risk school? Well, by the way, I would, you know, Paul Burkett um, definitely, you know, aligned himself very early on with Foster in the um, in the aughts. And but I find his book marx and nature to be so much more sort of broader and it kind of like is an ecological reading of all marx's political economy like value and rent and um uh, got a great reading or critique of the growth of program in there yeah that. it just it, it's really expansive and i really that's one of my favorite books in the kind of canon of ecological marxism to me the the metabolic rift school I think um, tries too hard to like find like to again di- dive really deep into Marx to kind of find his ecological perspective in this idea of a metabolic rift, which he just mentioned once in volume three, <laughs> and and of course he does. I mean, to be fair, he mentions metabolism a lot. It's very clear that th- this idea of metabolism between society and nature is pretty important to him, and he's a very materialist thinker and all. But um, uh, to me, like all the focus is, is, is it's trying to put all this attention on this is the ecological marks. It's focused on metabolism. But again, I, I would agree with Burkett that we actually what we need to do is think much more broadly about how we can think ecologically about Marx's more general categories. Like the one I've been kind of banging around is we need a theory of surplus value generation and exploitation that takes into account ecology and takes into account ecological relations and we need to look at class struggle and um, you know uh, the productive forces the relations of production all these kind of classic Marxist categories need to be thought through ecologically as opposed to like going deep into the notebooks or going deep into volume three to find oh here's where ecology is 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 um, Marx Marx's ecology is here as opposed to um, trying to think through to be frank, his more important arguments, his more important categories, his more important theories, uh, I think they all have lots of deep ecological implications that we need to flesh out. So. Yeah, I think that is, I mean, um, recently I stumbled into debates about meanings of labor and the Goethe critique, which... <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe Labor Which, Day, Labor Day yeah, debates. <laughs> yeah. Anytime that I get into like labor creates all our value and then I like read that text and I'm like, clearly he says it doesn't except when he kind of implies that it does and then he says he doesn't again. And then I'm like, oh, well, yeah. The, the key is wealth, right? He's Right. He, he really distinguishes value from wealth and he, right in volume one, but also in the critique of Gotha program, he wants to make clear that when we're talking about wealth, which is this material you know, stuff and use values, you know, obviously labor and nature co-create wealth. Right. right? Yeah. Use values do require labor, but they're not, it's like, it's, but in the same way that like, uh, a, a, uh, child requires, requires two sets of DNA to be born. Like yeah. it's, 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 uh, so, so there's that. And there's also the whole, there's other implications too. like, like wealth can be invested, but unvalorized and mm-hmm. like in uh, like you can hold wealth and not ever touch it or, you know, at all, actually mm-hmm. not even use its use values. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you're basically hoarding its use values. Mm-hmm. And uh, Burkett makes a lot of what this actually means for ecology, which was kind of why I was arguing about, I, I, you know, correcting a dumb DSA sign doesn't really, it's not high on my priorities <laughs> of, of life, but, um, uh, you know, um, and, and as far as like labor creates all value, uh, as far as slogans go, it's always been a weird one for me because I'm like, well, if we're talking strict marks, um, it's not true. If we're talking like broad, it's kind of true, but you kind of have to be a Marxist to understand it anyway. And mm-hmm. at that point, it's not true anymore. So I don't like it. it um, so I don't know why that so many people die on this hill, but I don't really care if you think it's effective. I'm not going to be like, oh, you shouldn't use that sign. That's according to the Gertha critique yeah. uh, subsection two. Yeah. Um, but 
I do think it matters when we go to understand what Marx had to say about ecology in so much that there is a lot of ecology in Marx. And I think you and I would both agree. There's some, right. Right. It's not the primary thing he's worried about. I no. think. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I'm teaching capital volume one right now, which for the fifth time and it's the most fun thing I do as a professor. <laughs> and right now we're on chapter 15 chapter on large scale industry and machinery. And it's really frustrating, but the whole, the whole chapter is about, to me, it's actually quite ecological because it's all about energy and like machines mm -hmm. and like thermodynamics and stuff like that. Um, but there's like, I, I forget, I think that it's like three or four pages at the end of that chapter on agriculture. Um, and uh, it's like the most truncated, like just brief and like, oh, by the way, this machinery had impacts on agriculture. And then at the end, he has this line about how, you know, this development of machinery and agriculture, like, um, despoils the 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 original sources of wealth, the soil, and the worker. And that one quote is just like it's glommed onto by the entire eco socialist canon. Like, look, he says capitalism destroys the soil, it destroys nature, and and it's like one paragraph in a long, 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 long chapter that you could not say is like about agriculture, about the soil, or about or or that agriculture and the soil is really formative to what he's talking about. But it certainly gets a lot of attention those those couple pages <laughs> yeah I, I go through my annual recitation actually usually because of the nature of running a uh, a loosely left-wing and i say that very loosely uh left-wing-ish podcast i have to go through my annual recitation of the of the davar torah aka capital volume one and um uh, it's it's interesting once you notice once you've read it like 10 times um and then once you notice like people hook up to it's not to be fair to the eco-socialists they're not the only ones who seem to find like a quote in that book and build their entire politics off of a quote in capital yeah but uh yeah you know and i guess that in some ways is better than the other thing we're going to talk about which is which is the the new left slash maybe also some of the new Marx lecture, uh, uh, newer Marx lecture. If I like fuck up the German, <laughs> I don't know uh, how to say that either. <laughs> um, uh, theoretically, I learned how to speak German 30, 25 mm. years ago, but I have I learned it in Bavaria, not in not mm. in Santa German, and uh. I have lost all my pronunciation and it shows like, it's just, I can still read it. But like when I'm trying to like say this stuff, I'm like, bleh, bleh. just say it like a drunk Englishman. <laughs> um, so uh, to get back to a point, um, the, I, I do think there's this way of digging down, but I, I kind of like, at least they're digging down on a quote in capital, as opposed to the people who dig down on a letter Marx wrote on the back of a napkin like uh that may have had his notes on some other guy once yeah um and yeah and and i i came up in the in the odds and when i first got into marxism a lot of i i encountered because it was freely available on the internet um was a lot of this new not new Marx lecture, but new left critique that was also like that. Like they take a line from the Grundusa and build an entire yeah. politics out of it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tony Negri. <laughs> um, but but so I, you know, I don't want to just come down on the eco socialists, but it does seem, uh, from my perspective, Marx is not the uber destructivist Promethean that he's portrayed as, but I don't really see the the primary focus in Marx are, are like the almost primary focus in Marx being ecology the way some of the eco-socialists want to argue and I yeah. don't really understand why they feel like they need to argue it that way like yeah it's yeah, I think I think Saito is most forceful in trying to say that, like, yeah, metabolism and the metabolic rift is like actually the central aspect of Marx's political economy. And you know, he's looked at more notebooks than me, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, but that to me seems 
pretty pretty off um yeah on the on my patreon i actually have been reading slowly with uh my co-host uh the 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 uh, first Sato book in English, uh, well, which is his book in German, but um, Karl Marx's Eco Socialism, yep. and I find the scholarship impressive, but the central claim that this is really what capital is about, mm-hmm. and if Marx had lived a little longer, this is what capital would have been. And uh, as a side note, uh. Marx lived a fair amount of time after Capital Volume One was published. <laughs> like so, um, yeah, and, a lot and of Cap- it revising Capital Volume One too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the idea to me that like he didn't have a chance to just go back and put all the cool stuff about soil in there and make it the number one thing seems like a kind of a stretch. Yeah. Um, but do you want to you want to go over your understanding of Sato's argument? So, um, again, a lot of it, uh, I think hinges on what you said before, which is this, this effort to, to really, um, take down this idea that Marx was a Promethean, um, Mm. thinker and that, you know, we just need to develop the productive forces and dominate nature and then socialism will be achieved. Um, as a side note, I just, I think what people don't recognize is that Marx, was and Engels for that matter, where they were living through on like a world historical transformation in our productive capacity and, and our, you know, relation to nature in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, production called the industrial revolution. And, uh, it seems pretty clear. You can call it Promethean, but it seems pretty clear that they saw this sort of revolution in the mode of production uh based in large scale machinery and and tech and automatic machinery they saw that as as something that was absolutely world changing and that created conditions uh for socialism and the abolition of poverty that didn't exist for most of history um and so you know in our in our sort of 21st century glasses we kind of look at any sort of idea that like large scale technology kind of creates a a a post-scarcity world makes it possible. We look at that as like Prometheanism or whatever. But to me, it was just like, for them, it was like, they just saw these, these just incredible changes in terms of, uh, you know, people, uh, urbanization, large scale productive capacity. Um, and okay. So, but your question about Saito is, so, he does try to show that like, yeah, if you look early in Marx, you see he is this bad Promethean. He talks about like, you know, developing the productive forces and dominating nature. But once you get deeper into the Marx of the 1860s, and then particularly after, uh, after Capital, which he does kind of try to trot out these notebooks, is that uh, you find that Marx became much more interested in metabolism and then the metabolic, the metabolic relation between nature and society and production. And what he finds in his study of Liebig and soil science is he finds that actually there are some really severe limits to um, agricultural's capacity to kind of overcome certain issues of fertility and so forth. And that technology actually can't overcome these limits, right? Um, and 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 therefore Marx became a much more, you know, <laughs> post the uh, limits to growth 1970s type thinker. He kind of recognized that there were these real serious ecological limits in the soil and the fertility that really couldn't be overcome and so therefore that he became an ecological thinker that acknowledges limits and and then you can do a through line i mean that's pretty much any degrowth that you're going to talk to today it says you know the first thing you need to you need to recognize is that there are these limits right that these biophysical planetary boundaries that cannot be superseded and we must acknowledge that they're there okay but the problem with Saito's argument is that Marx did recognize that these limits existed in soil fertility in the 1860s. But when Marx died in 1883, about, you know, uh, 30 years later, a little bit less, 20 something years later, the scientist Haber Bosch came up with this uh, way to create nitrogen out of the air in factories and create this thing called synthetic chemical nitrogen, which just completely shot through all those limits that Marx and Liebig were worried about. 
and actually many others were starting to get really worried about in the 1890s and there's these guano wars and all this kind of stuff but essentially the haber bosch process just destroyed those those limits and and basically after world war ii we started to do something that humanity had never done in history which is we were able to grow crops on the same freaking soil year after year without worrying about the fertility being exhausted from overuse and so um and that's just because we we take this external chemical stuff uh and we inject it in the soil and kind of keep the fertility going um so i and to be fair like you can raise a lot of ecological questions about this chemical fertilizer and whether or not it's sustainable and all these things but the fact is that uh if they're if marx sort of discovered these limits they weren't limits we overcame them and and in fact if you read a lot of other marxist thought it's very much and you can look in the grundries you can find i think there's a line about capital always is finding barriers and it overcomes these barriers right <laughs> and and uh so uh marx writes a lot about how capital sees limits and then it overcomes them through um you know, through going through crisis, through, um, through, uh, you know, technological innovation, all these kind of things. So, um, to me, like the idea that there are these fixed static limits or planetary boundaries or whatever you want to call them is like very antithetical to how Marx thought about the world and particularly about how he thought about capitalism. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting when we talk about like Liebig and soil depletion, uh, which uh, is, I don't know, like, or something of the uh, first Sato book. Um, and like you said, it's not, it's not that it's completely unrelevant. We do have to find a way to like deal with the, fall with the fallout of overuse of nitrogen and fertilizers but like we know that theoretically not just theoretically it's, it's it's actually also a matter of just like finding a suitable replacement that doesn't cause red algae blooms yeah um that this is handleable because we've handled it multiple times like mm -hmm. you know i don't want to give libertarians uh too much credit for anything but they aren't wrong about that the the way in which like i don't know ecological collapse uh and over complexity does seem to lead to innovation and i say this as a person who as a side note kind of takes uh joseph tainer seriously about complexity but like mm. we we do we can't I think this is a way to building towards another question. How much do you think the general atmosphere of the seventies for which like uh, that super racist population bomb book and people mm -hmm. think I'm being unfair. That book is racist. Um, oh God. Yes. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the way, like the beginnings of what we would later call anarcho primitivism, like an almost new romanticism that talks about the, 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 everybody from the socialist world to the capitalist world talking about austerity in some form or another, mm -hmm. including the Soviet debt crisis, not just the Western mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how much of the, how much of the fact that the eco-socialist milieu as we know it really, I mean, it's not to say that there wasn't environmental work done and like actually existing socialist countries, uh, a aes countries um and i'm putting it in quotation marks to avoid the battle but whether or not that's a valid term um uh i i, I see you out there watching and listening i know what you're gonna say um we're not we're not dealing with that right now um but we, i know that they did stuff to deal with the environment i know they also had environmental disasters they also have they also at other times have fairly progressive environmental policy um but eco-socialism as we understand it does seem to come out of that 70s milieu and develops through the 90s of the children of those of, of the new I mean, and and this is the part that i think that actually john bellamy foster kind of betrays without realizing it that like it's a clear generational story like we're the students of these people mm -hmm. uh and mm -hmm. we kind of split two ways those of us who were 
yes, th- yes, we have to impose this on Marx and those of us who are like, oh, it's already in Marx. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then, you know, that produces a, a whole array of thinking in which we both talked about uh, Paul, Paul Burkett, uh, super fan. Um, <laughs> and then it gets us into uh, the current debates um, with, a, with a few, you know, a few kind of exceptions. I mean, there's people like uh, uh, Lee Phillips, who I um, don't always agree with at all, um, but who um, very much does kind of take a green Prometheanism as a baseline. Yeah. Um, and talks about growth. I, I, I have argued with him, not because I disagree with some of his policies. I'm just like, but when we're talking about growth in the terms of productive capacity to build up resources, it's actually a completely different thing than when we're talking about growth of GDP to keep an economy yeah. on the profitability oh, yeah. side. Those are separate things. And we just happen to use the same word for them. Yeah. So yeah. it's confused in the way we talk about it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, I have argued with, with Phillips, but you seem to be kind of, um, you've been associated with him a lot, um, yeah. recently and not to slander Lee cause I know him. Um, I, but I think that's not, I think that's just because you've both been arguing with a particular type of degrowth. Right. Um, but how much do you think the seventies informs everybody else on the uh, eco-socialist left? First, I mean, I should, I, I am friends with Lee and I, I agree with him on lots of stuff. Um, I, I'm probably less willing to sort of full throated be like Promethean in the sense of like, our goal is to like dominate um, and subdue nature. I think he's more like in that vein. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much in the vein that, um, uh, you know, what I've embraced the term, which is really a slanderous term, but eco modernism, which has very bourgeois, uh, elements. But to me, like Marx, Marxism, and I was explaining this before is, is a modernist perspective. It's about that, you know, like, industrial um industrialization create that created these material conditions uh that didn't exist in history okay i've said that before so the 70s um again i think you did have this this real crisis moment both in the economy and in the energy system you know you had an energy crisis you had a sense that like the 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 post-war um boom and affluence was was basically coming to an end and it was coming against what people assumed were very natural, like natural limits, right? Like they were, you know, the energy crisis was constructed as something that had to do with a a geological scarcity of energy, which um, it really shouldn't have because it had nothing to do with that. Um, But a lot of people, you know, then you mentioned Ehrlich and the definitely racist book, The Population Bomb. And but then, you know, the limits to growth. And there was just a sense that, like, you know, post war era was fun, but now it's time to tighten our belts and it's time to kind of accept that we, uh, you know, that we all have enough, right? And we need to sort of do more with less, right? That seemed to be the, the, the message from whether, you know, it's the kind of like neoliberals who are trying to say we need like budget restraint in the, you know, in the, in the spending. uh, And we need to like crush these unions that are greedy and they're pushing prices up and they're causing inflation. We need to, you know, they need to tighten up. And then, and also because of this environmental crisis, we also need to accept that we just, we, we have it too good and we need to do more with less. And, and so everyone kind of converged on this kind of um, austerity um, mindset, I would say. And, and it, it all just sort of complemented one another. And um, out of that morass came a very influential school of economics um, called uh, ecological economics, which basically was a full throttle critique and an attack on neoclassical economics and, and particularly Keynesian economics, which had, as you said, had really put all its energy into 
understanding the economy as this monetary system that you can measure in terms of GDP growth and that you can smooth out cycles with fiscal spending and all this kind of stuff. And these if biophysical, they call themselves biophysical or ecological economists. They were like, you guys are completely misunderstanding the nature of the economy itself. You think it's only about money and markets and you're you're losing, you're, you're forgetting that it's fundamentally a physical economy that's rooted in energy and um, energy systems. And, you know, they came up with these ideas in the midst of an energy crisis. So it made a lot of sense. And and they um, they even started to debate, if you can believe it, they started to propose energy theories of value and they were critiquing labor theories. They were going against the kind of orthodox Marxist labor theory of value. And uh, this kind of energeticism um, was always sort of rooted in the idea that fossil fuels are fixed. There's a fixed amount of them and we're just like, you know, we're burning all this stuff up and pretty soon we're going to reach the entropy limits of these fossil fuels. And we're going to kind of so civilization is going to have to go through a kind of basic collapse or just sort of down, downscaling or um, what is Foster recently um, <laughs> cited a book that I think it's called a prosperous way down, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like this assumption that because fossil fuels are abundant and because we rooted everything on fossil fuels and because we, we can't figure out a way to get off of fossil fuels, we're going to have to come up against these entropy entropy limits and um and and have to deal with it so very pessimistic and then in, interestingly it's these same ecological economists who became uh the basic people who started shouting about peak oil in the late 90s and the early 2000s and you know um it, uh, sort of uh it, it it's become a kind of um with these people it's like become a, a boy cries wolf situation where they're always like here it is the moment where we're running out of energy and the entropy is about to collapse all around us um but in any event incidentally it's it's the ecological economists who really people like herman daly and then and many many others who who really influenced what now i think has become a school of ecological economics, which is degrowth, which again is 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 not necessarily talking about entropy and um, energetic limits to growth like those folks were, but are just saying that like, you know, obviously when we look at planetary boundaries and things, it, it means we have to kind of reduce, we have to, you know, it's ultimately comes down to we have to do more with less, right? We have to reduce the, our material throughput, which has become a kind of weird, way in which degrowthers kind of justify, okay, you want to degrow. Well, what do you want to degrow? And then they say, well, we don't want to degrow GDP because that's called recession and that's bad, right? We want to degrow something called material throughput, which is the sort of a sort of abstract kind of computational understanding of all the different energy and materials that flow through an economy at any given time. And we want to kind of look at that aggregate measure and reduce it, right? And we also, they they have said, like Jason Hickel has said, um, we do want to reduce energy consumption in rich countries only, right? We're only going to degrow in the global north. Uh, but in any event, all these people really have their roots in that kind of ecological economics moment in the 1970s, I would argue. So, Yeah, yeah. We were talking off air about how energy accounting reminds me of the first attempts of it, which is techno uh, technocracy Inc. Um, exactly, which, yeah. which for people who don't know, um, was another quote utopian movement. It, it kind of still existed up into the aughts and stuff like this, uh, the Venus Project, but that's like a weird late form, um, where. There, it was a techno utopian Jetsons like future, but where everything is done on energy accounting um, instead of labor accounting. And they were kind of, I mean, they kind of disappeared in the 40s because they see, I mean, in the 40s and 50s in the States because they seemingly got wrapped up in anti communism mm -hmm. um, because they sounded kind of communist to mm -hmm. people. But they, wanted to plan. They, they were big on planning, right? Right. Everything was planned. Uh, the instead of, you know, money or labor tokens, it was going to be net energy tokens. 
um, and they thought that you could develop. But unlike degrowthers, they thought you really could develop massive industrial production, right? Um, yeah. Based off of energy accounting, yeah. um, and that as long as you weren't exhausting your resources and kept everything at a net neutral in terms of energy accounting, you could grow other stuff. And I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm bringing it up as a as kind of a where it seems like some of this ecological economics came as a kind of backlash to Keynesianism. And I know today, since we live in neoliberalism, everybody forgets that Keynesianism and Marxism were historically opposed, uh, mm -hmm. that they only became copacetic after, you know, the Chicago school people and the, and the neo Austrians mm -hmm. won. Um, but, and I say that because like um, someone like, uh jason hinkle will say he's you know an mmt or a marxist and also as an mmt or that means he has a direct relationship to Keynes. Right. Um, right. uh and he kind of sees the mechanism of energy growth can be done through monetary and fiscal policy together mm -hmm. uh which fine and and you know look you and i wouldn't disagree that we need to develop uh, a whole lot of the planet more equitably and get rid of this uneven development problem i mean that's not like something we would we would have a problem with i just you would say uh you would say i believe and i'm gonna let you respond to this that we don't have to do it by by those clear kind of just blanket prohibitions in the same way yeah we don't have and to like reduce energy consumption here to bring it up there. Yeah. And I may have said this the last time I talked to you, but it's energy is, is really an infrastructural problem, right? You know, mm -hmm. like the, the, the degrowthers talk about, well, the, the global North needs to degrow their energy consumption as, because of justice, right? Justice for the global South, because we consume too much energy and we need to kind of, degrow so that the global south can grow their energy but it's not like us decreasing energy just can be transferred to the global south um uh because the problem with the global south is what they they don't have like basically modern energy infrastructure like an electricity grid um and you know uh pipeline networks and uh transportation fuel depots and stuff like that and that and Essentially, what they need is like a you know a, a a more Marxist idea of like developing the productive forces so that they can actually have reliable uh, electricity, um, and and that just takes investment, right? It doesn't take moving energy, m moving like calories from the north to the south. It's not this like um, you know transferable commodity like bananas or something. Oh, we should not talk about bananas. Um, yeah, be careful with that. Um, so uh it's you know so and and also you know um okay if we're if we're gonna be on carbon-based energy forever then you can make a case well yeah we need to degrow energy use because carbon combustion is bad and it's cooking the planet and and therefore i i'm on board but everyone understands that the goal is to decarbonize the energy system and make it not run on carbon. And if we were to do that, then it's, it's not entirely clear why we need to reduce it, right? And so the whole quantitative reduction focus of degrowth is not clear if we just make our focus on decarbonization and, and you know, and decarbonization is not degrowth. It's actually a, a process of developing the productive forces to, to invest in technologies that g generate energy without carbon, which there are many, and many of them uh, are not particularly profitable to capital right now. So one of the problems is uh, it's a classical kind of Marxist problem where um, the social relations of production do not allow certain low carbon technologies to be developed because the market says they're not competitive in the market. Um, so so uh, the whole, to me, like the whole quantitative focus on we need to reduce and degrow is, is 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 sort of a distraction from the real problem for us is that is one of lack of control and power over investment over the allocation of social resources and that's what we need um and if we were able to have power over investment and over 
what how production's organized, then we would be able to um, decarbonize and 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 reorient infrastructure and technology in ways that could solve these problems. But we just are stuck in a world in which all the means of production is are controlled by capital, and they aren't that interested in solving social problems. They're interested in profit. And, and everyone's shouting about degrowth, but really what we need to do is take power and control over, over, over production away from them. Right. Yeah. Well, this is, this is actually something that I think a lot about. Um, one of the interesting kind of paradoxes that I've seen in the way a lot of people, at least like Hinkle frames were growth, uh, is that it both, depends on a super on an international or supranational enforcement mechanism because mm -hmm. i don't know how the hell you're gonna do that and yet also basically assumes simultaneously about national developmental barriers that we currently have like that like that element of it is very strange to me it's like it both goes beyond current national boundaries because it would have to to work Mm -hmm. And yet, also assumes and accepts national boundaries and national and our current national developmental limits as something we would still have when you have the capacity to force states to to lower their energy uses. Like like, like that to me is is a very strange. Like it, it it sounds intuitive at first, but when you think about what it's actually demanding, as far as like how you organize an international program even if it's like between between the current existing nations but they're all treated as equals relative to their population or or anything like that like um it still doesn't make sense to me that you would assume these same frameworks and some of these schemas don't uh we mentioned half earth socialism um which is i think a more explicitly anti-marxist one but they still kind of do the same thing where it's like, well, we need to take the stuff away from this part of the world and move it to this part of the world. And mm -hmm. then the other thing they argue is like over 50% of the population would be engaged in agriculture. And I'm like, well, that means you're out subsistence agriculture. And that's stupid. Yeah. Like, and I, I'm not against like people have asked me, like, are you against people being in agriculture? No. I mean, like, if you want to go have a garden, great. But like, that's different from trying to produce, uh, you know, in an ideal society, maybe we'd all work on the farm for an hour a day. I don't know. Right. But but um, do I would would 50 percent of our of our labor activity go into food? That doesn't make sense when you don't have to. And if you have to, it does imply something pretty bad has happened, yeah. uh, including a fairly massive population die off, to be frank. I can't Jeez. see how else that would work. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. You know. It was it. It's not. It's a, it's not the same argument as like arguing with the primitive primitivists from the nineties and the aughts, uh, but oh. it's not that far different from them. Uh, for those of you who don't know, primitivism would require us to go back to hunter gathering, which would require, by almost any estimate, at least a ninety eight percent die off of the population for the for their models of oh yeah of uh, human development to be viable, and. Uh, and I don't know. I don't even like implicitly implying super genocide. So like um, are hoping for it, are saying it's inevitable. These all seem like. Um, and the, the foster degrowth, he, he explicitly called for substituting for fossil fuel, replacing fossil fuel with labor, mm -hmm. <laughs> which and he was saying this in reference to agriculture. And and to me, when you when you start to to push these degrowth people, they all agree that you know what, a lot more people got to be farmers in our future socialist society. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I don't think they really quite understand. I mean, in the United States, a hundred years ago, there was probably 30, 35 percent of the population in agriculture, and now it's like one point five percent, right? Right. It's just we've just completely gone away from a society in which uh, people uh, need to be working the land to produce the basic material basis. So if your political program is about enrolling millions of people to work the land, like you really have to think about like how you're going to mobilize that kind of uh, enthusiasm for that kind of program, right? 
And, um, you know, you can talk about everyone can garden for an hour, but people also don't. One thing I've been hammering on recently is people don't really understand, like our food system is really rooted in basically like a small set of of grain staple crops, right? Like the world agriculture is based on basically wheat, rice and corn. And that's, you know, mass industrial scale production of those crops are what underlies everyone's subsistence and food. And it's cool that you want to garden and grow some carrots and tomatoes and vegetables, and that's fun and all, but like basic food staple crops are what are what everyone's, you know, I I read something recently, like two thirds of calories on the world that are consumed today are those three crops, right? And so you don't see people gardening wheat and corn and and rice because ever yeah so the so (laughs) so you better figure out how you're gonna grow those crops or some substitute some grain substitute to to kind of think about how you're gonna provision a society right billions of people on the planet right now and then and these people they, they have no answer they just have this idea of sort of like people working in vegetable gardens so yeah, I I have a I have a vegetable garden. Oh, I like vegetable. Yeah, garden. we all, I do too. We all do. And uh, I'm also big on like, you know, uh, biodiversity and in crops and stuff. I think Lee and I have actually maybe fought about this. Um, but uh, one of the things that I will point out that's like, dude, if I tried to live, even if I tripled the land I currently own. All right, which by the way, you're gonna have to trip a land you're currently on for everybody on the planet, which I don't know how you're gonna do. <laughs> um, maybe if you do some South Korea style, like I, I do have my whole breakdown urban like uh urban suburban differences through like intense housing in rural areas, but you know, that's also a massive amount of building, and these people don't want to do that. So um, but maybe if you I I actually just you can't live off of a garden, I guess is my point. Like, like, and we can't go back to subsistence cropping that, that, I mean, for one, we haven't done that in. This is longer than the industrial revolution since we gave up that in most planet. Um, And, and two, when I was reading that, like fifty percent of people going into into agriculture and replace that with labor, I was like, "Well, doesn't that a get into your soil problems?" Um, yeah. Uh, B. Uh, so we're gonna exhaust the soil doing that. Like, I don't see how we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, well, we can use rotational crop techniques, not at that scale. Two. Uh, um. You, we want to talk about geography again. There's a weird magical equalization of geography when you talk about this too, because I'm like, you can't grow wheat, rice, or, or yes, uh, exactly. You know, everywhere on uh, on the, in the planet, like like there's specifically certain places. The United States happens to be one of them. Russia, Ukraine happens to be another. But for example, China can't actually and never has been able to actually produce enough rice by itself to feed its population it's always had to trade because its soil Mm. is just not productive Mm. enough for the kinds of populations it tends to produce Mm. um that's like a known thing Mm -hmm. like and uh it's a big deal overcoming that that was one of you know for for better or worse one of mao's accomplishments um and but the transition to it even if you assume the best was brutal, like, and I'm just like, why on earth would you want to do that? Like, um, you know, when we could foreseeably, for example, being vested, being investing in, you know, uh, agricultural efficiency in ways which would allow us to spare more land for other stuff, uh, not even development, just like, you know, if we're not, consuming stuff for for capital like rewilding stuff you think people exactly. care about that like yeah. uh you yeah. know it just seems it just seems weird to me to like that when when i hit that vision i was like this is this doesn't even seem particularly green if i think about it hard like right. Right. 
Like, also, do you guys know how how like as a person who who was born in the South and studied the change of the Southern landscape, um, plantation cropping completely stripped the Southern landscape to the point that I mean, both the weird pines and the and the kudzu and all the things we associate with the South are basically things that were brought in to quickly like. Revi- revamp and save the soil because literally they couldn't keep it down because of the because of the kinds of mass agriculture they had to do mm-hmm. uh, with you know uh, a high labor base that yeah. labor base being slaves but yeah. nonetheless so it's just it just seems to me like if you think if you know anything about the historical development of agriculture this is a bad idea like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um uh, the other thing you've had to fight, and this is not from the Marxist degrowth people, and not even necessarily from the half earth people, but from people defending them, is this idea that labor is inherently anti environmental and a dismissal of of the stuff that that you like discovered as if that stuff was just superficial to environmentalism. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think this is so popular? There is a, there is a very strong not just anti-capitalist, but anti anti uh, work in a bad way um, uh, strain in environmentalism. And it does seem to dip into certain kinds of degrowth. The yeah. definitely some of the defenses I've seen of degrowth actually comes from this school I mean, comes from these kinds of arguments. I think I think it's because um for better or worse, a lot of the environmental movement developed into a movement that aimed to shut down and and block various destructive industrial uh, facilities or infrastructures. Um, mm-hmm. Some of it very righteously so. You know, you can think about Standing Rock and trying to shut down that pipeline, but you know, there's countless other pipeline struggles or. You can think about the old earth firsters in the Pacific Northwest trying to shut down logging operations. And um, and because so much, and nowadays in Europe, you have people, uh, activists trying to shut down coal mines and things like this. And uh, I mean, it's just obvious that that kind of activism is going to antagonize the industrial workers and the, sometimes the unions that represent those workers in those sectors. And so you get um, an antagonism where the unions are going to say, we need this stuff for jobs. The environmentalists are going to say, we need to shut this shit down and and just repeat that over and over again. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, I, w- I went to... <laughs> A, a social, it was actually a socialism conference recently where I was like, you know, if we want to, um, you know, solve climate change is about energy systems, electricity systems. We should probably listen to the workers in those, the unions in those systems. Um, you know, the industrial union should be like leading in our climate strategy. I just said like, you know, if you're a Marxist, like the workers who do the work, they have the knowledge, they have the skills to kind of guide us uh, to understand how to change and transform these systems. And I got attacked from all these basic people that were right, that they were were so invested in these kind of anti-pipeline struggles. And that was what socialism was to them that that they couldn't see that there's, there, there could be this kind of um, uh, perspective that, saw the industrial unions and the workers in these sectors as like they have to be a key agent of change if we're going to solve this and and like we were saying before like if we're going to solve climate change it's actually going to require we can't just block fossil fuels right we can't just be shutting shit down we have to actually build totally new energy systems and infrastructures and and again like i said decarbonize all these systems and and also by the way as you were just saying in relation to south korea like restructure uh, our cities and do more dense housing and um, public transit. And that's going to be a, 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 a shit ton of building. And who does building but industrial workers and, and electricians and, 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 and other types of workers and unions that have been painted as the antagonist 
of the environmental movement, but it's those workers who who would have a lot to gain if we actually had an environmental politics that that was really about building a new world as opposed to just shutting down the world they don't want to see, right? And and um, so you know you're starting to see this kind of emergent. Some people it's kind of can be lame, like supply side liberalism or whatever that Ezra Klein called it a politics or sorry a liberalism that builds. But you're seeing like a, a new kind of environment. Even Bill McKibben wrote an article that we need to get over nimbyism and, and we need to build, you know, for him, solar like solar panels and we need to build transmission lines. We need to build, build. And so people are starting to come around to this idea that like actually solving climate change is about building. And, and if they come around to that, then I think this sort of antagonism with workers in the environment might be overcome because I think, you know, who's going to, see more benefit in a politics of building than the building trades right like it's it, there's going to be sort of natural alliances that can be forged in that kind of context but you know on the other hand we do live in kind of um uh we still live i think in a period where you know who's going to do the who's going to do the investment who's going to do this kind of burst of of investment and maybe the inflation reduction act is that but i'm not so sure i think it would need to be a much more public investment, kind of um, New Deal esque type of of of, of boom of, yeah. of infrastructure building that we haven't seen in this country for decades. Right? I mean, the UAW strike actually indicates this because one of the vision lines, even within the UAW strikers, is how they should relate to uh, electric vehicles, um, because it does kind of hurt a lot of workers' bottom lines. It doesn't have to, and it wouldn't yeah. necessarily, but on current conditions, a lot of the stuff, a lot of this green stuff has been in some ways been hostile to the working class as it's come in with like de-unionized jobs and stuff like that. If you've ever heard about the solar sector, you kind of know a little bit about oh, this. Yeah. Like it, it it like green energy, unfortunately, because it's came in you know the 90s and aughts, tends to have shittier working conditions than oh, yeah. than you know people who negotiated their 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 contract traditions and starting in the 50s mm -hmm. um and that's a problem for for us who care about the environment a good deal but it's not a problem that is inherent to green you know to green development it's a problem that is literally you know a, a class political economic problem like it's it's not uh it is not a hard limit um does not have to be that way i I would say that, you know, that I think it's unfortunate that if you're talking about, if you only think green energy is, is solar and wind farms. You're kind of in trouble anyway. Honestly. Yeah. Well, you're in trouble <laughs> from a, a talk about entropy and thermo that you're in trouble from an energy perspective, but, but those types of installations are just like sort of naturally not conducive to labor organizing because they are temporary jobs. They are building something that is uh, uh, a construction job, right? And once you build it, actually, um, I use this example. There's this solar farm they're building in Texas, and they got a good union contract to build it. I think it was something like 1,800 construction jobs to build it. But then when the, the solar farm is finished, it actually is going to have two or three permanent jobs, <laughs> two or three. <laughs> so it's not like a power plant that is like or like a factory if you will that has long term you know um uh you know family like union jobs that would be there forever right it's just temporary transient precarious type of work um that said i do think you know if who knows if if this will work but biden wants to also onshore a lot of manufacturing of the components like solar and wind and batteries so obviously manufacturing and factories are could can be quite conducive to labor organizing can produce kind of concentrated workers that can organize uh and build power in one place over a long term period um so that could i think be more more have have more potential but like this idea that like you go to um, someone who's worked in a coal fired power plant for their whole life and you say like, you'll be fine. You'll, 
you just move to the solar industry, which means like building temporary solar construction. It's just not the same type of job. It's going to be a shitty job. Yeah, that's a. Uh... I think people miss that when we talk about, you know, this current investment round. I think you're also just right from an entropy perspective over reliance on solar and wind is a problem. I mean, it just is a problem. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about physics, it's going to be a problem. Um, The. I think part of the, I think the elephant in the room on this is uh, the nuclear energy words. Yeah. Um, and while I do realize and before people at me, um, there are tons <laughs> of problems with nuclear energy. Sure. Although you can't at me anymore. I'm not on Twitter anymore. Ha. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can at me on blue sky or something. Um, but before people at me, um, I realize the problems with long term with long term overuse of nuclear power, but we are seeing in Germany, particularly, yeah. that that uh, the ways people have handled reducing nuclear power is just to outsource their carbon, you know, extraction and burning to another country, or to. I mean, they're literally building coal plants in Germany right yeah, now. Yeah, they're insourcing it. Which is absurd. I mean, yeah. like... They were tearing down a wind farm to build a coal mine. I believe that's it was a coal mine that they're opening back up to. And they had to tear down wind farm to do it. I mean, that's... that's uh, You know, thank you, SPD Green Alliance. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it, that to me just seems like even if you're skeptical of nuclear power, and like I said, I I, I, I do understand there are, that there are going to be problems with the waste. I understand that you, there's limited amounts of of uh, fissile materials in the world. I get it. Like, but if your if your responses do nothing, I, I actually I just don't I actually don't think I don't know what people suggest we do um in response to this because it's like we know that we can't yet produce uh enough wind and solar i am like you i'm not a i'm not a non-carbon energy skeptic but i am sort of like we talk about wind and solar i go like well i know you guys keep on telling me that everything's eventually gonna get super efficient and things have gotten a lot more efficient i they have in the last 10 years particularly mm -hmm. But uh, there's no way that that will ever be as efficient as you'd like it for the dreaded second law of thermodynamics readings. Mm -hmm. um, and unless you can convince me that cell technology can do magic, right. um, we have to have some other things. There are other, I mean, if you're in certain areas, there are things you can do geothermal. I don't know how people feel about hydroelectric. I don't know if that's cool anymore or not. Um, uh, I came from a place with a lot of hydroelectric power. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty much tapped out. You know, we've basically harnessed all the hydro we can harness. Yeah. There's and, not uh, any more places we could build lakes where it would work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's very geographically specific. <laughs> Geothermal is traditionally been very rare places where you can do it, but there's Iceland. very, yeah, <laughs> Iceland's a big one, but there's, there's a new kind of, um, uh, breakthrough in what's called enhanced geothermal. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of optimism that perhaps we could do it in many more places. And by the way, they're, they're basically using the same technology as fracking to to harness geothermal in this in this new way of drilling down um and uh and so that's very exciting if it, it and geothermal if you can do it it can it, it can provide 24 7 electricity so it's, it's called firm power mm. and so that's that's what you want renewable firm power it would be amazing um but as you suggested, uh, it's not even the laws of thermodynamics. It's basically the fact that the weather changes. That, that you know, solar and wind are reliant on the weather, and the weather um, is unpredictable. And you know, um, one example I often I've been using lately is 
last December, there was a big Financial Times headline like, the UK is generating 67% of its energy from wind power. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And if you read the article, like deep down, they're like, by the way, three weeks ago, they were generating 2% of their energy from wind because two weeks ago, the wind wasn't blowing, right? And um, mm. uh, it's... And people will tell you, you know, oh, we have storage, you know, the batteries are so cheap now, but the batteries really provide power for about four hours. There's no what's called long duration storage. Uh, that's kind of you need something that will provide power in the winter when it's not very sunny and it's not very windy sometimes for weeks at a time. And basically, there aren't a lot of really great options for long duration storage that they figured out right now. So essentially what that means is that when it comes to no low carbon or zero carbon electricity sources, we're basically looking at hydro tapped out, but good. I mean, where we have it, it's great. And uh, geothermal, um, if we can expand it, that would be awesome. And then you have nuclear, which is again, proven. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, you know, you brought up the waste issue, um, which it's been, you know, people worry about the waste, but the, f the fact is the waste has never really led to any sort of, any sort of verifiable death or sickness ever, <laughs> because we've actually highly regulated and figured out how to contain that waste. And, but, and the other really important thing, and this is more thermodynamics is that it's 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 really amazing that like just these tiny little uranium pellets create so much energy by the the fission process and the waste they create is so small that literally um all the nuclear waste that's ever been created by power plants could be stacked maybe i forget how much i i used to know this figure but it's like you know you stack it like maybe um 25 feet high in a football field mm -hmm. and it's that's all the waste ever created right and if you compare that to the amount of like toxic coal ash that's produced from one single you know coal-fired power plant it's just like millions of tons every year of coal ash and not to mention pounds of emissions churning out and um uh so um you know the waste also uh you would like to find like long-term storage for it because right now we just store it on site in these very impenetrable steel casks which are again totally safe and we've figured out how to do it and no one's worried about it but um the fins the fin finland is figuring out they they're going to put this stuff deep deep in the geological storage and you know you you have sort of uh, existential questions about how do you uh how do you store that stuff? And like, if some other human civilization were to find it, how do you communicate? It's, it's, it's not very good. You don't want to touch this stuff and stuff like that. But much of the discussion of nuclear waste is sort of hypothetical. Um, you know, it could be a real problem if it ever spilled or ever did, but, but it hasn't because we figured out how to deal with it. And, and by the way, uh, solar and wind, um, they create a lot of waste too because it's all this sort of heavy metal toxic stuff that has to be thrown away when those when those components are done so anyway don't yeah. get me going on nuclear I can go. <laughs> yeah i am uh I think that's that is you know uh, a th that's one of the things I think it distinguishes you from a lot of degrowers. Uh, I don't know that all degrowers are anti-nuclear. In fact, I don't suspect they are. But most a lot are. Of okay, <laughs> if you can uh, find me a pro-nuclear degrowther, I'd love to meet that person. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, as I've indicated, I I am not super enthusiastic about long-term nuclear but when we talk about nuclear right now i'm just like no we got to do it like yeah we got to do it um uh the, in the last couple of years i've just seen how france has handled the situation and how germany has and france wins <laughs> so it's it, it's uh it, um it just seems I know that, I mean, to, to address people's concerns, other than the things we talked about, like misunderstanding nuclear waste issue, failures 
there's a psychological issue here because failures with nuclear are catastrophic. But there's literally only been like four. Um, and there's only really been one. <laughs> oh, you did. And it was it was the AS the the AS uh, regime. Okay, as you referred to before. Yes, yes, Chernobyl. Wait, uh, sorry. What did you say? Is there is it AES? AES, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Soviet one. Um yeah, the AES. Actually existing socialism is the is the polite term that we use for uh states that call themselves socialist. Um or did call themselves socialist. Um the Yeah, I mean, the Chernobyl, I guess Fukushima is far more complicated because you have the problems of the tsunami. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, let's see, Three Mile Island. Nothing. I guess I didn't really actually go badly. So, yeah, you got one, maybe two. Um, <laughs> so, whereas deaths by coal power plants are astronomically high but they're diffuse and hidden yeah so and particularly for those of you who really care about this stuff it's really bad in the developing world i've lived near some of these places yeah. where they're not using modern cold technology or not as modern as we are mm -hmm. and the air quality is bad um There's so a study a couple years ago it's fossil fuels kill about nine million annually and you know, even with Chernobyl, I forget how many, but it's in the low thousands that they can verify died, right? And there's just not a lot of other deaths you can find attributed to nuclear power, but fossil fuels, it's just this, like you said, a slow drumbeat of, of, of you know, um, asthma and other heart disease that come from air quality issues from this stuff yeah it's uh it's it's bad um and it's a lot it's slightly better here because we have better scrubbers but it's mm -hmm. still bad um yeah. plus we're just gonna run out of it and you don't want to pump it into the environment to the environment like it's there's a bunch of reasons why we should be decarbonizing as best we can um and you you did mention um we there is a problem with nuclear with what you just mentioned, which is that we could run out of uranium, right? That there's a fixed amount of uranium. Mm. Um, and so I, I haven't quite gone into the thorium rabbit hole and alternatives. And obviously if we can get fusion power, that's a whole nother world. But um, I do think that's a legitimate concern. Like mm. we could, you know, we could run out of uranium. And so um, you do have to think about that at least. Yeah, um, but again, this seems far off from degrowth. So, if I was to to reframe this debate, where I could, you know, bring us all back together in a in a happy kumbaya land, which the internet has made impossible for anything ever, but um, uh, maybe climate change will reverse the powers of the internet. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I would say, like, instead of pro-growth, you know, and, the, you know, that's kind of Lee, Lee Phillips' move, um, and degrowth growth uh, eco-socialism, I'm just like, can we just talk about, like, different, uh, yeah. like, yeah. the whole growth metaphor is a problem in and of itself, like, can we just talk about, exactly. like, a different economy, period, yeah, and exactly. a different relation yeah. to ecology emerging from that? Yeah, and, exactly, yeah. And maybe we also don't have to find every justification for that in an obscure notebook by Marx. <laughs> like maybe we yeah. just do it. Like, yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, not to not to be to begrudge my Marxology bros, as I, if anyone who watches the channel is actually one of them, quite a bit of the time. But for stuff like this, I just don't think we need it. It's just not necessary. Right. Like. Like we can still accept a lot of what Marx has to tell us about class structure. And we don't even, and I'm not saying this from like this old eco socialist who got to bring it in. It's just kind of neutral mm -hmm. to, to this. Um, so 
with that said, uh, where would people find more of your work, Matt? Um, if you Google Matt Huber Syracuse, you'll get my faculty webpage. With I try to update it frequently with all the writings. Um, I put the more public writing up top in the peer-reviewed uh, paywalled corporate academic journal stuff below that. <laughs> um, and obviously I wrote this, it's not a new book anymore, but uh, Climate Change is Class War, which you can find on Verso Books. And I'm maybe not for long, but still on the, the, the hellscape we call X now. Uh, and I'm at, at Matt Huber 78 on that. If hellscape. you're going to waste your life on a hellscape that's called X that apparently lately can't even stay up uh, uh, and functional. Um, and I don't say this as part of the woke anti-Twitter mob. I just hate what it does to my psychology and find almost any other social media better, although not by a lot. Um, but if you're going to do it, follow Matt. Cause I actually really enjoy your reading and I, that you and Jason Moore, and then you two fighting with people is basically how I keep up with what's going on in the <laughs> eco socialist sphere. Um, so it's like, I, okay. think, I think both of us like to fight with people. I think that's fair. <laughs> yes. Although, uh, I, you, like many people, your Twitter persona, you're, you, you're not snarky or mean, I will say that, but you do you do pick a lot of fights. Um, <laughs> as a person who also picks fights, but is kind of snarky and mean, um, uh, I appreciate that about you. The uh, But if, if uh, you were to listen to, say, uh, Jason Moore, more likely to pick fights. I like Jason. I really enjoyed the interview, but I was not expecting the long uh, discursive bias differences with John Bellamy Foster before I even asked much. Yeah. Um. So, so people check out that episode if you want to check out Matt. Matt, do you appear on podcasts other than mine? I know you do, but you can plug them if you'd like. Yeah, you know, I've I've been on Left Reckoning quite a few times. I love those guys. Um. Uh. For another for for if the the listeners aren't alienated um i was on one called uh 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 decouple which is a pro-nuclear podcast so you can look up and i talk about um the tennessee valley authority and electricity deregulation and all these kind of interesting politics um another one i was on uh, to talk about similar issues with electricity was the uh bunga cast which is a, a another yeah. one i i enjoy I, so. like, I like uh alex ochili and i uh uh like to be snarky together um back when i was on formerly known as twitter um yeah he can have some snark um uh, yeah and uh i also should mention that the jacobin show got you know rest in peace which i was on several times and i'm very sad it doesn't exist anymore but yeah yeah um, as a person who, who both enjoyed the Jacobin show, but also, uh, feels the need to constantly call Jacobin Gerongin cause I'm an asshole. Uh, study Robespierre. What are you people doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, pure, yeah. <laughs> If you're not, if it's not the mountain, I don't care. No. Um, oh man, obscure Finch Revolution jokes that are also digs. Anyway, um, so but yes, the Jackman show was. Uh, I actually really enjoyed that show when it was on. Um, uh, so people just check out Matt's work. I guess is my point. And if you're Thank on, you. if you're on the X landscape, his his uh, his account is one to follow. Um, sorry, Matt, though. I'm not going back for you. All right. Um, and on that note, we're out. Mm -hmm.